Manchester's indie rock and roll station. Excess Manchester. The Excess Manchester Long Player. An iconic album in full with Jim Salverson. Excess Manchester. Hello, musical loving friends. I'm Jim Salverson, and this is the Excess Long Player looking back and deep into classic indie albums. Today's classic album, well, it's only a couple of years old, but I still think it falls into that category because it was the first album from a Scottish band as a debut release to get to number one in the UK charts. Since the views, hats off to the buskers, a album that has previously featured on the Excess Long Play. You can go back and listen to the interview with Carl Faulkner, but we're not talking about that now. We're talking about the Snuts debut album, WL, from 2021 and what an album this is genuinely i think it's one of the best albums of the last 10 years and i get to talk about it in all its glory with callum from the band if you listen to the radio show version of this podcast where we play through the whole album and talk about each track track by track then there's a load more in this podcast that you won't have heard in the radio show because a some of the stories just weren't fit for radio b Callum likes a bit of fruity language and that doesn't go down very well on radio stations and C, there's a bit of chat in here about what the band are up to now and why they split from the record label and the new album that's coming out very soon. It is a treat for Snuts fans this so I hope you enjoy it. Callum from the Snuts talking about WL. Callum, how you doing man? I'm good, I'm good, how are you? Yeah, really good, thanks. So we're looking at your debut album today, WL, which feels like it was absolutely ages ago, but actually only came out in 2021. I think it feels so long ago because there's been a lot of water under the bridge since then, there's been a lot of music since then as well. Yeah. But actually, rather than 2021, to get kind of the full story of this album, I think we need to go back a little bit further, back to the very start of the band and the origin of the stats, which... I believe, now correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the Snuts started as an entity because ultimately you were looking for a way to get into pubs when you were underage and have a beer. Do you know, I actually, I think that's how like probably 80% of young bands in Britain <laughs> actually start out because cause you never think it's actually possible to do it as a job so you'd only try to use it as leverage to get free drinks and stuff. But that certainly, certainly was the case with us. So there's a pub in Bathgate so just so we were from Whitburn, but there's a town next door which is like slightly bigger, and that had a pub called um, the Attic, and that's where bands played. And then there was a pub underneath called the Lounge. But if you got in the Attic, it meant you could just get in the Lounge, like just like, you know on a Wednesday and stuff. <laughs> so like, that was the kind of that was us made it at that point. We kind of just wanted to do it pub circuit, but luckily it's turned out slightly better than just in the pub circuit. Was there a moment when it kind of flipped for you and you suddenly went from going, hang on, this is a way we can get a pine, to there's something in this. There's a career here, or if not a career, there's like more than a hobby. Um, I think it was like, I would probably say it's from the record for Glasgow would be, like the demo version of Glasgow would be would be the kind of moment where like, ah, oh, like shit, people seem to be catching on. We, we played it in a, so we just recorded Glasgow. Say that weekend, we had a charity gig, or it had maybe been out two weeks or something. And then we had a charity gig in like a local pub again. But we all had six songs, but we were headlining. So like we played to the six songs and then folk were like, one more tune in that. And we're like, <laughs> we, don't, we don't have any more tunes. We started with Glasgow and then we played it again at the end. And people like lost their shit and they were like, maybe, maybe, maybe there's something in this. <laughs> Do you know that way? There was only about 30 people in the pub, but it, it kind of made us think like, shit, if we can get this reaction here, like what would happen if we kind of branched out a bit. So then we just kept knocking out demos. It was our mate, Jamie Laverty. He was paying for them at the time. He had his, his shit slightly more together than we did. So he was paying for the demos. And his mate, who's turned out to our mate, uh, James Grant, he was recording them in his bedroom. Um, so when, once we kind of done those demos, we were kind of away with the head down. And we sold out a local cricket club, which was like just run by like a kind of like local gangster character who let us like sell it to as many people as could come in like do it was like a complete fire hazard <laughs> mate honestly i'm not joking so you see at the time it felt like it was about a thousand people there i bet it was about maybe 150 but after that gig we were like shit we should maybe try and uh turn this into something so the two bands that i think in those early days that i heard you being compared to time and time again were the libertines and the arctic monkeys they were kind of the two comparisons that were often made a Scottish Libertines or a Glasgow Arctic Monkeys or something like that. But the other phrase that I've heard banded around connected with you, and you're going to have to educate a stupid Englishman here, was Scottish Ned culture. Now, 
I've got no idea what Scottish no. neck culture is. Can you enlighten me in any way? I would say like the English equivalent would be like a chart. All so right, okay. like, do you know what I mean? Like we used to rap about and like bear goose jackets zipped right up, like trackies, socks tucked into the trackies, air maxies, like we bought classics, like uh, that kind of. Right. Like, it's actually turned into quite an aesthetic. Like, do you know, it's quite a hipster aesthetic now, but back then it was just like you were hanging about in the streets and you had to stay warm. So you were wearing like mountaineering clothes. The only way I could describe it is like somebody from Liverpool. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like that kind of vibe, man. That was like the vibe. That was what we were all about, man. I don't know if that's if we have such affinity. Like as Scottish people, we have such an affinity with Scousers because our cultures are very, very similar. <laughs> so it's like kind of like that vibe, man. So we just we were, we were playing in forests and stuff. So we were like rapping about, like dressed like that, but also the acoustic guitars. So it was like a bit of a a bit of a juxtaposition. So we would kind of play for like. Like, people would, like, obviously, like, some people would be drinking, some people might be smoking and that, just then we would be playing our guitars in the corner, almost like a soundtrack to the antisocial behaviour. <laughs> <laughs> like that kind of... So it was like, a, you know, like, a wholesome. It was wholesome, but also antisocial. It was a juxtaposition. If we're talking about influences, I think the one quote that really stood out for me when I was looking back at the early days and the interviews you did back at the start was, you said, our biggest inspiration is not to sound exactly like anybody else. How much of a mission statement did that become for the band when you're pulling that album together? Were there tunes that kind of you had knocking about that you might have recorded demos of or you might have been throwing around as a band that just didn't make the cut purely because you went, oh, that sounds too much like that band or that sounds too much like that band? Maybe not as much that, but we went through a period just before we started properly recording the first album where every song that we wrote just sounded like us again, but like repurposed like in repackaged and we kind of went through a bit of a, a rut with that just before we actually started recording because like so we went to LA to record the first album and in our heads the album was done like we had 12 songs there they were written they just needed re-recorded to a better level but they were super similar to each other almost and then we went over to LA and the producer we worked with at the time Inflow basically like wrapped all the songs up we had and like made us start again and at the time I think that felt like a really like almost like a personal attack like I don't think we really understood like what he was trying to do with that but in a way that kind of forced us to create the album we did because like the tracks just wouldn't exist in it if we hadn't had that kind of moment of realisation and also there would be probably tracks on it that, that we are glad now aren't on it because they're just not as strong and they, they didn't represent us as well so there's certainly been stuff we've cut before that's maybe sounded too much like us in a past incarnation as opposed to anybody else. So I think that would be more of a mission statement. We try not to sound like ourselves too much. So where would that drive to be different kind of come from in that case? If, you're, if you've if you got this set of albums that you're taking to a producer and he's sitting down and he's going, no, we need to rip these up, we need to make these sound different. Was that intention from those sessions or was the producer kind of picking up on those intentions and going, look, this is what, this is what I know you want, even if you don't know you want it almost? Mate, see, to be honest, right, I actually don't know because, like, I don't know if, like, Inflow, man, he's quite like a, what's like, a, almost like a mystical character. <laughs> so, like, he speaks entirely in riddles. Everything's a lesson. He would, like, take you to the cinemas halfway through the recording session as you were putting down a take and then just leave you there for, like, four hours. He would phone you at, like, 10 o'clock at night and just tell you you had to come in straight away and then you'd be in till 7 in the morning. So, like, I, I don't know the method to his madness, but it seemed to work. Was there a stretch? I mean, you mentioned the guys earlier that kind of produced the demos. Was there ever a difficulty in kind of moving on from them and taking on a new producer for the production of the album and leaving your mates that had kind of helped you in the early days behind? I definitely think that is quite a big part of why we didn't record, like re-record a lot of songs that we maybe had sitting on EPs and stuff. Not that you, you not 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 in the the sense that anybody would be offended or something, but like just at that point in time that song was complete and it was fine the way it was. Do you know what I mean? It was perfect the way it was. You didn't need to change it. But then you come into a room with another producer and a lot of stuff changes. So you leave this disconnect with fans who were maybe super attached to a demo version of a track. Then they hear the reproduced version and it doesn't quite take them to the heights and doesn't make them feel the same emotionally as that first version. So you're almost competing against yourself. So I would say we felt more like that as opposed to guilty or something for moving away because, do you know, everybody understands that as you start to progress and anybody that works in the music industry starts to understand that, like, as you progress, 
it's not about like having like friends and like you doing somebody over or something moving to a more professional setup it's just yeah. like there's levels to everything do you know what i mean like there was a point we were happy once we played all the venues and that we wanted to play in the pub circuit in scotland we felt like we were on top and then you break to the next level and then the next level and it's like kind of a, a constant tiered cake that you never ever get to the icing in the top so i don't think anybody ever felt offended or anything i just think we didn't feel we could give the songs justice again and um, so we just stuck to we re-recorded Sing For Your Supper and we re-recorded Glasgow, which were fan favourites, and then we just kept everything else as it was. I want to come back to the re-recording of Glasgow in a little bit, but before I do, in terms of the tracks on this album, a fair few of them were written in those early days of the band. You mentioned Glasgow earlier and that kind of being the song that made you go, oh, hang on, there's, there's something in this. So we're talking about songs that were recorded, maybe some of them when you were as young as 15. It's best part of a decade, maybe, between that and the album being released. Yeah. How did you as a band, how did your relationship change with those songs? Because if I look back when I was 25 at something I'd written when I was 15, I don't think I'd recognise the person that was writing that. Mm -hmm. Is it the same when you've kind of got a song that's kind of been with you that long? I, I would say with some songs, like songs that we don't play anymore, like they make sense to not play anymore. Like you always have like a fan, like, so we released a song like Manhattan Project before we released the first record. Oh, play Manhattan Project. And it was like, that was a bit like, one year is breaking up with like our 17 year old girlfriend when we were 17 or something like do you know what i mean or like like so it's like why would this like so why would we play that but then there's like ones like do you like sing for your supper we don't really play that anymore but like we still recorded it for the album that was about like our mate who had left to move to australia and he's, he's moved back he stays here now <laughs> do you know what i mean so it's like there's some songs that you definitely like the emotional part of it is long gone is like dead and buried even glasgow like the emotional part of that for us is probably gone as to its original meaning. But now what it means is like that moment of like looking out and when the riff kicks in, you see the crowd go and like you see people chanting in and suddenly a song like that takes on a new meaning because it's now like it belongs to the fans at that point. By the time the song's written and recorded, as an artist, you've kind of had your cathartic, catharticness, I don't even know if that's a word, but like you've had your, <laughs> your fun with it, if you know what I mean. You, you've released what you need to release and you've recorded this bit of music. And then when a song lasts 10 years, that stops belonging to you. <laughs> like, that is no longer your song at that point. That is just something that that is that, that means a lot to people. It's a memory at that point. It's a moment. It's something they can fucking play at their wedding if they want. That that at that point, I think, um, I'm getting all emotional. I don't even know <laughs> what I'm talking about. I've had two coffees this morning. I'm just, I'm just running, mate. I know what you mean. And it's something a lot of artists on this podcast have talked about before. The idea that when you release a song, at that moment in time, it's no longer your record, it's someone else's record, it's someone else's tune, it's an mm. audience's, they put their own meaning on it, and it almost becomes like folk music. It's like, yeah. it gets taken to different places that you probably don't intend in the first place. Yeah, 100%, but that's like, you know, folk music, some of the oldest music in the world, so if in, in 2,000 years somebody could be humming <laughs> the top line melody to Glasgow, <laughs> yeah. I would love that. <laughs> I would love that. That would be amazing. Looking back at this album, and I was listening back to it earlier, it's really varied, and I think obviously you've, you've kind of outlined the reasons why the producer came in and you wanted to make it varied, and that was the intention of the band from the get-go, that you didn't want to sound the same, you didn't want to sound like yourself on each tune. But was there ever a concern about how it would hang together as kind of one record, as one piece of work, when you've got all these different influences and all these different sounds going on? A thousand percent. Like, do you know how many record label meetings we've been in or like, there is no cohesion in this music. <laughs> this doesn't fucking sound like an album. This doesn't even, these two tracks, we can't even release a double A side because they sound that different. Do you know what I mean? Like, we've kind of had that all our lives. We've always had somebody telling us that the way that we're doing it isn't quite the way we should be doing that. And we should always try and, do you know, do you ever fucking tell Picasso? See, when he drew a nose on somebody's forehead, was anybody like, Picasso, that nose shouldn't be on that forehead. Because he knows it's not meant to be on that forehead, but he's created it, do you know what I mean? It's about expressing yourself. So with that first record, man, it is a bit of a mixed bag and there is definitely, like, I can understand a, a record label's confusion at it, but to us it made sense and hopefully the fans it made sense. So I wouldn't change anything about it. Leading up to the release of the record, there was this buzz that was kind of building up around you and there was loads of significant things that were happening along the way. There was like Radio 1 playlist, which was amazing. Annie Mac kind of playing your tunes for the very first time. You got featured on FIFA 21 on the soundtrack to that, which is like, that's a dream for most people. Was there a particular moment before the album came out that you just kind of sat back and went, this is madness. There's something happening here. How did, how did we get to this point? 
So before we released, we just released the EP leading into the record and we've done a lot of the recording for the record and then Strongbow asked us to do a cover the Summer in the City and they flew us to South Africa for like four days, business class, like an absolutely, like we used to stay in travel lodges, like ever, up religiously up and down the country, any service station travel lodge I probably stayed at it. Um, so to jump through that, those like both sharing a room in travel lodges to get to business class to like a six star hotel in South Africa with like your own jacuzzi in the room and that and like we went in and they had like three outfits for us hanging up and stuff that was all the right sizes and stuff and that was a bit like yeah <laughs> this is definitely slightly better than playing the pub circuit but yeah it was really cool man it's, do you know it was nice I liked it I, I, I would never um, I like I like being shoulder to shoulder there's something that makes you feel nice about it. do you know what I mean when I see when I've got job on that side and Joe that side and I'm just kind of asleep for 16 hours that's kind of my happy place. So, so business class was almost wasted on me. We spoke earlier about the period of time between the formation of the band and the recording and the release of the album, which was quite a long time, which was made even longer by the arrival of COVID, which delayed the release. At the time, you'd been sitting on the record. I think it had been pretty much completed for three years already. And then kind of COVID hit and you had to wait that little bit more. What was that like? Just kind of going, I mean, it's probably the right decision at the end of the day, but like hitting pause and going, we don't know when we're going to be able to give this record to the fans. Yeah, it was quite mad, COVID, man, because we actually, it feels like we recorded two records in COVID, but it was actually a wee bit of a blessing because as much as we said the record was finished, we kept recording. So like, even though like we felt the record, it was like almost a, like a ruthless edit because it meant that if you recorded something that was better, something else just came off and then... It just went like that. So like there was tracks like Somebody Loves You. We hadn't even recorded that until lockdown. And then in the kind of that kind of lull period where you could travel if you had like a letter for like your yeah, mum yeah. basically saying that you were allowed to travel. So we got to go down to London and we actually done a lot of recording in that time and a lot of tweaking throughout that period, which was quite nice because it just gave us time to really get it in a place that, that we were totally happy with. I want to talk about a couple of specific tracks off the album, if that's all right. And I'd like you to pick a couple too in a moment. So maybe tracks that you just love or there's stuff that linked to it or memories or moments from the recording, whatever really, it's up to you. But first, I want to talk about, we've already mentioned it, Glasgow, which was the first track that made me aware of you. And I think it's probably the same for quite a lot of people. It was the first track that kind of gave you that mass awareness. And it was a fan favourite. There was a lot of love for the original version and the demo version. So when you went in to record it for the album, were there trepidations about re-recording it and potentially, like you say, disconnecting with the people who liked it originally? It was trepidations, by the way. I was trying to find that word earlier to use and you've just <laughs> used it amazingly there. Man, I'm not going to lie, right? So we, we were, I think everybody was, was a wee bit shitting themselves from recording Glasgow. So we recorded it. So it was like all this build up. So we basically recorded most of the record and we were back down in the Warner building in London. And where is it? I, I, don't, I can't remember, but it's in London. And underneath it, they've got a studio called The Fire Pit. And it's like basically like recording music, but like next door is Darth Vader kind of vibes. Do you know what I mean? Like it's like this pure evil layer. And the bottom is just this like really fucking nice studio. The guy that runs it, Rich Woodcraft, he's like one of the nicest, most legendary guys in the world. And the amount of stuff he's mixed and touched, like the amount of great records he's touched is like Google Rich Woodcraft disc discography and just look at his mixing thing. It's fucking insane, right? So he, he runs our studio. So we were in with Tony Hoffer and him. Tony was like, he's American. He's like, guys, how are we, we going to crack this? How are we going to crack this track? And we're like thinking, like, oh, what we got to do? Like, do you know, when we, we played this live, it was all, we were all just drunk, it was scrappy and stuff. So he's like, I know, I know what we need to do. And he had this rule that was like no hard liquor in the studio. And so he comes back into the studio and he's got three bottles of, uh, four bottles of Buckfast sitting, one for each of us, in our instrument set up, like, in our, like, as if we were going to play live, he's like, right. So he, and Jordan, sorry, was through in another room, he had his bottle of wine in another room. And uh, the three of us, me, Joe, and Jack set up in one room. And he was like, the only way we can capture this energy is if you just keep drinking as you're recording. <laughs> so we just fucking smashed it, honestly, mate. We just smashed it take after take, and he'd be like, guys, drink. And we'd, we'd drink like, more, and he'd be like, right, go again, and we'd go again, right? And he just fucking done that for ages, man. And so I think this was maybe like that a night, and then the next again morning, they came in, overdubs and stuff, jacked in a vocal, and it's like, it actually really slotted together. 
really nicely. It felt like there was a lot of fear, kind of for nothing. And then once you started like drinking that liquid confidence, it kind of started dissolving. And I think Tony really got well between Tony and Jack in the mix, they really got the energy and like what Glasgow was. And I think they really done it justice bringing it into this era of the snuts. Well, that era of the snuts, but in a fucking different era of the snuts now. But do you know what I mean? So ultimately, it is the version that's on the album is at least in part recorded as live, powered by Buckfast. Yeah, that's it, mate. Powered by Buckfast. That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, honestly, it's so funny. But do you know, we, we, we reached out to Buckfast, like, during, like, we, I don't really drink it anymore, but, like, during our Kenny, as this first record was kicking off, like, come on, like, get behind the boys in that bit of support, and they, they do not appreciate it at all. Like, they're like, no, we are <laughs> religious monks who make this fucking drink for old people. <laughs> it's like, no, you don't. You're not, you, you know who you make it for. You're a fucking hypocrite. God won't save you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right, the uh, second track I want to talk about is Juan Belmonte, which is a song that's named after a Spanish bullfighter. Now, for a band and an album that I think is, in general, I think is quite rooted in your surroundings. It's like Glasgow, Boardwalk, Somebody Loves You. It's all kind of got connections to Glasgow and West Lothian and kind of Scotland. It felt like a bit of a leap to me when I saw that song. And is it, does it come from the same place as kind of the inspiration point of view, the idea that you want to do something different? Was that kind of the point behind it, or is it a little bit deeper than that? I mean, it's actually less deep than that. Um, okay. So, like, we had, so see in Scotland, right? See if, like, if you say one, if you're, like, just, like, speaking colloquially, you say one, like, I would have one of them. Like, so we used to call that track, because it's just a big riff and a big beat, we used to call it the big one all the time, right? So it was like, it was, oh, do you want to play the big one in that? Like, we didn't have a name for it, right? So we'd play it, play it, play it. And we just released the Matador EP. So then we're like, it'd be funny to name this. Like, one, like, the Spanish name. And then they Googled, like, who was the most, the biggest Spanish Matador. And it came up, Juan Belmonte is the most celebrated Spanish Matador. And we were like, and it was like, just a big fat swaggery tune. And we were like, Juan Belmonte. <laughs> and from that point, it never references Juan Belmonte once in the song. Like, not once. His niece reached out to us. And he remembers, like, that's my uncle. Cheers for using them on a track. Nice. Wow. Okay, cool. Right, I want you to pick a couple of tracks off it then. So anything that you love off the album or there's a moment that you remember from being in the studio or the writing, what would be your picks off the uh, tracks on WL? Uh, so I'm going to say, like, All Your Friends is, like, quite a big one for me just because, so we arrived in LA and we were working the inflow and he kind of sat, took us out in this room and we were in this studio and it's called Downtown LA and it's basically like a, you ever seen, the, you ever seen Ghostbusters? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, see, like, the big house they've got in Ghostbusters that they're kind of their base of operations. Yeah, the fire station. Yeah, like, that's, like, the vibe of DTLA, right? It's, like, totally, like, they can expose brickwork and, like, sliding doors and, like, you can hear crickets. Like, there's crickets live in the studio and you can hear them as you're walking about. So, like, we'd never seen anything like this. We used to record in an industrial estate in Livingston, so it was, like, this was, like, a fucking different world. We walked up to the studio and it's, like, us four and our managers came and in flows inside. So he brings us into this room, five of us sit on a couch, and he just gets us to play through influences and stuff. We're playing that, and he's just like, to our manager, right, you fuck off, basically. <laughs> and our manager's like, what? And he's like, go. We're like, oh, like you, don't, you don't need to be here, Matt. Like, you're fucking, you're ruining everything. Kind of vibes. And our manager was like, what? And then left, let it go. He got fucked out, basically, so he left. And then uh, he was like, right. So he set us all up in different corners of this room, but we were all in the one room. And he was like, go and play something. And we're like, shit, so we're all playing different stuff in that. Like, can't really hear each other kind of vibes. And, like, he was speaking to Jack, like, maybe, like, 20 feet away from me. And I didn't even have my guitar plugged in. I just played that, like, boom, 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 boom. And, like, I've actually got the recording on my phone because I was recording it. And you just hear them, like, stopping his conversation. He's like, Hugh, that was cold. Come here. <laughs> like, he just took me. He recorded that riff. Like, honestly, I recorded that riff in, like, 10 seconds, and he was like, right, basically, like, I'm done with you, go. Wow. And I was done. And he got some drums off Jordan. And then we all got kicked out the studio, too. Me, Joe, and, ja and Jordan got kicked out the studio. And then we came in the next again day, and it was, like, first verse and chorus to all your friends and started. So it was, like, for me, it was really the, the thing that kind of kicked us off. But I always remember him just, like, it was, like, you could barely hear it. But it was, like, his ear is obviously that good. Like, when he recognises something that yeah. he loves, he can just uh, find it. So that was a big one for me. Um, they're all, you know, they're all kind of got emotional attachments. Before before we kind of came on this, I wrote out, like, every song. And then, like, a kind of story about every song. But, like, obviously I can't do that. I would talk to them in fucking three days. <laughs> and it's like, it kind of, it was really nice. Do you know, it was really nice, actually, like, 
I, I don't listen to the record. It's not like you sit and listen to your own records, you know what I mean? Well, maybe people do, but I, I don't. So it was like nice just to like delve back into these tracks. So like I was kind of delving back into it, just listening and just thinking about like the stories and stuff. And it's like every single track that was like, I'm quite lucky to have this because it like documents so many points in your life. Like people just go through their lives and they don't have like these fragments of memories stored in places like Spotify or like your mate's hard drive and stuff. So it's nice to kind of go back in. Another one for me that I thought was like super nice was like when no no place no place I'd rather go and it was about me Blair Murray man and we were like in LA and we were all best mates at the time and we're still we're still really good mates but like we went to LA and we're like missing our friends and we felt like we should be in this like dream world and uh, no place was born and there's just loads of lyrics and it was like a lyric and it's like the uh, wine by the rocks. And it's just like talking about us being like 15, 16 year olds. We used to like drink at this set of rocks called like the Westy Rocks, they were called. And it's like now Blair's got that like, he played at his dad's funeral and stuff. And it's just, you know, one of these songs that like, before a song like even becomes your fans and stuff, like you're just playing this to your mates. So it kind of belongs to your mates as well. So see when your mate, like a song means so much to your mate. And then like you see all these important points of their life and they always lead to that song. I think stuff like that is quite beautiful. It's not really a funny story or that, that song. It was a bit heavy. <laughs> but aye, man, no place, man. I, 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 love, I love playing that live as well. And I always think, man, especially, like, I just remember the, we played a gig and it was, like, two weeks after his dad died, man. And, like, you know, playing that song was, like, aye, it was just proper, like, super emotional, man. And as you said earlier, I'm sure there's people who love the band who have attached those kind of stories to those oh, tunes as well. Man, therefore. I could sit and talk to you through all the tracks but I'm, I'm probably conscious of time so i want to talk instead about when the album came out the album actually finally dropping because came out went to number one in the album charts first scottish band since the view to get a debut number one record which was helped in some parts by lewis capaldi lending his support and encouraging his kind of army of followers to get behind the record and kind of download it and buy it and listen to it and all that kind of thing how did that come about? How did that relationship with Lewis Capaldi come about? Is it just because you're from the same area of Scotland? Um, oh, no. So, so we've knew Lewis. Um, we've knew Lewis for ages, man. Um, so, like, even, like, back to, like, when Tea in the Park was kind of happening, I remember, like, Lewis, like, so, like, everybody used to sit in, like, a big circle with their chairs. And, like, Lewis was, like, we were all mad Ben Howard fans. And we are going to see Ben Howard. But I think he was going at the same time as, like, 1975 or something. And Lewis was just, like, 1975 are fucking amazing. And we are like, oh, Ben Howard's fucking amazing. Like, it was, like, that kind of, like, drunken argument. <laughs> um, but I know I've known each other for a while. So he he went to... I went to Whitburn Academy. He went to St. Kent's. But Jack got kicked out of Whitburn and had to go to St. Kent's. So they kind of knew each other through school. And then we... Obviously, like, the pub circuit in West Lothian wasn't exactly massive. So, like... Do you know, I actually seen Lewis, it was before he got signed, he used to be in a band called Cool Blue, and I seen them in the attic that I was talking about earlier. They played Adam Warrington, you know, Youngblood's guitarist. Yeah. So he was Lewis's, he, he, he was Lewis's guitarist at the time. They, like, they, like, I know Adam as well, but we were all kind of, like, kicking about at the same time. Like, I just might remember being blown away in that, like, room, just like, man, he's fucking amazing. He's seriously, like, that voice is incredible. And then, like, fast forward, like, he got signed, we got signed and stuff. So, yeah, I've been known Lewis for a while. We actually played a gig with him in Wagonoff from the X Factor <laughs> at one point as well. So we've, we've kind of went through the same, we've kind of came through the same shit gig struggle <laughs> as each other, but he is obviously stratospherically, stratospherically bigger <laughs> than us now. Only, only for now. Callum, really nice to speak to you about WL. I genuinely think it's not just one of the best debut albums of the last five years, I think it's one of the best albums of the last five years. Cheers, man. I just want to pick up briefly, this isn't about WL, but I just want to ask you because it reminded me when you were speaking earlier about kind of the struggles with record label conversations and kind of them not quite getting where you're going obviously recently you've split up with your label you've gone and done your own thing which huge admiration for you guys to go and set up on your own and kind of do what you want to do basically is that why you've kind of made that call to give you the freedom to do what you want to do yeah just across the board so definitely in the no, maybe not as much the first record because we were kind of learning the ropes as well but the second record especially towards like the selling of it and the marketing it, we kind of noticed ourselves and the label just kind of like diverging on nearly every single point that came up. We would kind of have opposite opinions and like, well, we almost had opposite intentions and mad. Like, I think we actually had an opposite end goal and everything. So I think it was like always destined for this to happen. And I think the guy who signed us, Nick Burgess, is a massive guitar head. Like, he signed Blossoms, he done um, The Cooks, like, he, like he's done like a lot of guitar stuff. And he loves that. 
but I think he was trying to drag us into a world that we maybe no drag us. We 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 like I love Nick. He was a great guy, but I think he wanted a bigger thing for us than what we were. I think to be in that system, you need to be willing to compromise everything. Like I think you need to, you you have to be prepared to do that, and I I don't think we were prepared to do that. I think as well creatively, like not even necessarily musically, but everything in like you know the way you dress and stuff, and like but at one point they banned us from wearing the jackets zipped up and stuff like do you know what i mean like like it was just like flat like it was just total total different goals different different opinions on everything so we decided we had to kind of take things back into our own hands or we would just be become a band that we never intended to be um we had a really damning last meeting with them where they kind of told us that the, the music didn't matter and we had to basically go home and study the charts and find out what tiktok hits were like working and stuff and I was like shit man I like I didn't leave leave the school to fucking come and do homework and it was a great time like we had a great time at Warner and Parlophone we had a we made some great music made some great friends but it just reached the point where we were like we've got to stop enjoying doing this if we keep doing this this way so why not take things into our own hands and just see what happens do you know what I mean roll the dice back our own horse and since we've done it we have made more money from streams in this six months than we made in four years of Powerphone. So that kind of exposes uh, the major label system for what it is. There's more money in music now than there's ever been, but it's distributed unfairly to the artist. So I, we, we had to leave. Said bye. So what's next? We've got some new music from you, but we don't have any information yet on an album or when it's coming out or what it's going to look like or even if the singles we've had are going to be from an album. Can you tell us anything yet about when we're going to be able to get our hands on it? Um, if it exists. Oh, it exists. It exists in its entirety. And it is completed. So we're just having a wee bit of downtime and now. Just chilling. Just taking a bit of time to like regroup. We, we took quite hard towards the end of last year, so we needed a bit of time to reset up. But there is... A single coming out super soon. And there's got to be more. Lots more. <laughs> nice one, man. Really nice to talk to you. Talk us through the debut. Really enjoyed it. I'll tell you what. You you should sit down and listen to it at some point. Because it's cracking. <laughs> you might really enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> right through. I will. I'll try. I'll try. I'll try and get, I'll try and get all the way through it. <laughs> there's about fucking 30 songs in it, mate. <laughs> Look at that. Keep your time. <laughs> nice one, mate. <laughs> right, see you later, man. <laughs> Access Manchester Long Player, an iconic album in full with Jim Salverson. Access Manchester. Told you it was a good one. Awesome chat with Callum. Awesome album as well. If you've not listened to WL in a bit, go back through it. Get stuck in. The link is in the podcast description, as is the link to the view. Hats off to the Buskers, which, as I said, was the previous debut album from a Scottish band to get to number one in the album charts before the Snuts stole that title. Loads more episodes to get stuck into if you enjoyed this one. Loads of awesome albums from awesome bands and memory stories and inspirations from the people who helped make that album. Have a look in the back catalogue, see what takes your fancy. And don't forget to like and subscribe to this podcast so you get the next episode as soon as it's ready. And if you want to get in touch and tell me who you'd like to hear from in this series, you can do it via the Q&A function on Spotify. You can get me on Twitter at Mr. Underscore Jim Bob or just leave a rating or review with your thoughts. See you soon. The Excess Manchester Long Player, an iconic album in full with Jim Salverson. Excess Manchester.